excited to present with you guys um, and talk a little about Zipline, take you guys behind the scenes of our distribution center in Rwanda. Zipline is the world's first national scale drone delivery service. We deliver life-saving medical products, uh, and our focus is doing that in the hardest to reach places in the world. We do this with small robotic planes we call Zips. And uh, this all started about three years ago with a trip to Tanzania, where we were visiting the Ithikara Health Institute there. And we met this really impressive public health researcher named Zach, who had gone out and collected a massive database where he had just asked doctors out in the field in these remote areas of Tanzania to text him every time they didn't have a medical supply on hand to treat a patient. And so he brought us over to this Excel spreadsheet and he sorts it by how many of those patients died because they didn't have the medical supply on hand. And then he sorts it again by how many of those patients uh, developed very complicated, basically secondary infections and other complications just because in the first place when that patient came in, the medical product wasn't in hand. Uh, and that's really where Zipline came from. Uh, we spent the last three years uh, building Zipline, and I'll talk about it a little bit later, but we, starting in October uh, of last year, we started delivering uh, in Rwanda. So this, uh, uh, this is a big problem, and I think to put some numbers on it, uh, the World Health Organization estimates that 5.8 million children die every year from lack of access to medical products. You know, just to make sure that number, you understand how big that number is, that's more children than are born in the United States every year. And of course, this is just children. Lack of access to medical products obviously affects everyone at all ages. These are some photos to drive the point home for you of what the infrastructure is like in a lot of these places in the world. That's a truck fording a road that's obviously flooded. Um, this is a high quality bridge. As you can see, it's precarious. And more often than not, this infrastructure, especially in the rainy seasons, results in unsuccessful deliveries. Uh, and uh, you know, these trucks, motorcycles, however they're trying to operate today, just don't get the medical supply through. And this is, this is the problem that Zipline is solving today, and we're really excited to scale to solve in a, at a global scale. So let me give you a sense for what we're doing in Rwanda. We started del making deliveries in October. Uh, we deliver right now exclusively blood and blood products. So this is things like red blood cells, plasma, platelets. Uh, and we are currently scaling up to deliver to the 21 hospitals in what we call our service radius. So on this image here, that little Z in the middle, that's our distribution center. And each of those drops of blood, that's a delivery site uh, that, we are, that we're either serving today or we're scaling up to serve this year. We're focused on blood for some really practical reasons. Blood products have a shelf life of between five and 40 days from the time of donation. So you gotta get that blood gets donated, transported to the capital where it's tested and typed, and then sent back out to the points of use. That's a really short amount of time. And, uh, Obviously, the, 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 the lack of f good physical infrastructure, roads and bridges, is a big impediment to main, making sure you always have the blood you need when, where you need it out in these remote hospitals. Um, to give a sense of where blood is used in Rwanda and basically where the demand comes from, there's two primary sources of demand. 40% of all of the blood in Rwanda is used to treat mothers after they've given birth uh, for postpartum hemorrhaging. Another 40% of all the blood used in Rwanda is used to treat uh, malaria-induced anemia in children. And these are two cases that obviously consume the vast majority of blood in Rwanda, where if you don't have blood, fatality rates are very high. If you do have blood, fatality rates are almost non-existent. And this is why it's so important to have the right blood product and the right at the place where it's actually needed. Um, as we scale up, our ultimate goal is to have 11 million citizens of Rwanda within this on-demand delivery network. Um, and looking to the future, we are looking well beyond blood to pharmaceuticals, vaccines, and other essential products, even products here that you might consider even over the counter to just ensure that 100% access. 
So we're a service provider to the government of Rwanda. Uh, we look like a magical courier service to them. Uh, the process is very simple. The, the, the doctor or the technician at the hospital who needs the blood product places an order with us over a web form. They can use WhatsApp. They can use text or phone, whatever they prefer or whatever's working. Uh, we then pack the blood uh, to prepare for, for shipment at our distribution center, put that in a zip, send the zip out. The zip flies autonomously, fully automatically out to the clinic where it drops the blood uh, into the yard of that hospital. Um, so before I kind of show you that process in action, uh, I want to give you a little tour of the zip line distribution center uh, in Muhanga, Rwanda. So starting, this is an image of our, we call it our, our air traffic control tower. Our zip controller sits in this tower. We think it's the first air traffic control tower built on a bathroom, which is what's below it. And uh, uh, anyway, as this, as this video pans up, uh, you'll see on the left here, that's where we recover zips. Uh, under the tent in the middle, that's where we have all our zip storage, uh, blood storage, and where we pre-flight the planes to prepare them for delivery. Sorry, pre-flight to prepare them for flight. On the right, you'll see uh, where we launch from. Uh, so let's, let's go inside. So this is uh, one of our flight operators carrying a zip. He just took it from the recovery system. He's going to place it on what we call a pre-flight test stand. Uh, this is, on this stand is where the zip gets a new battery, its next package, goes through a bunch of automated and manual pre-flight checks to make sure it's airworthy. Um, You'll see behind him in a second, another flight operator is taking a plane out of storage uh, to get it into circulation for, for that day. Um, I, like to, I really enjoy the details of the challenges here, and I, I, I want to talk to you about sort of the challenges of doing this in the real world, and I'll, I'll point out those little pink bags he's removing. Uh, those keep the bugs out of our air data sensors at night. Um, you can see out the other side of the tent there, that's where we launch. So the life cycle of a delivery starts with an order coming in, uh, and then our blood technicians take a box. Uh, they'll t take the units of blood required for the order. We have 100% traceability for the Rwandan governments. So they know where every unit of blood goes um, and how it's used. So you'll see I'm using the, you know, our digital systems for keeping track of that with the barcode scanner. Hopefully you've noticed there that blood is wrapped in a biodegradable insulation material to ensure that it stays uh, within an acceptable temperature range uh, during the flight, and then the operator puts it out the window for the flight operator to then uh, take it and put it in a zip. The flight operator will put it in a zip, put a zip on a launcher, uh, and then launch it. Launching zip line Hold on a sec. I think I need to plug in something. Zipline 26 in three, two, one. That static wasn't the zip, just to be clear. <laughs> um, yeah, so now that, that zip is on its way, flying fully automatically out to a health clinic uh, to make a delivery, and here's what that looks like. Um, so our zips will deliver from about 30 feet in the air. Uh, this is in slow motion, but it'll drop the package. The package floats down on a paper uh, parachute and will land right in front of the building uh, where they ordered the blood. The zip is, is automatically compensating for wind speed and direction so that from the time it drops that package, it lands where the customer actually wants it. Um, and I really love this video. This was the first time we delivered to this hospital, just the look on the spectator's faces of this zip just sort of flying through and this box of blood sort of dropping out of the sky. In Rwanda, we do two types of deliveries. We do uh, routine deliveries. Uh, so this is basically to maintain a minimum level of stock of common blood products. So these are basically red blood cells of common blood types uh, to maintain a stock at these clinics uh, for sort of day-to-day -day use. And then for all the other products, rare blood, uh, rare blood types and things like plasma and platelets, cryoprecipitate, those, and then of course, if demand exceeds the stock that they have, we then do what's called emergency deliveries. And somewhere around 30, uh, sometimes as high as 40% of our flights in a day are for emergency deliveries. 
versus those resupply deliveries of common blood types. Uh, and this is very exciting because it, it's, a bit, it's a huge part of letting Rwanda use their blood supply far more efficiently than if they had to forecast uh, you know, days or weeks typically ahead of where the blood might be, need, might be needed. Uh, they can keep it centralized in one location and send it out on demand instead. Um, so then the zip flies automatically home and lands. This is what landing looks like. Um, we get our inspiration from aircraft carriers and bouncy castles, as you'll see there. Uh, that's, that's a bouncy castle, a map made by a bouncy castle company. Um, for those of you with experience with drone operations at scale in the real world, uh, one of the big challenges I'll get to a little later is how you operate safely and reliably, because as you'll see in a video I'll show you in a minute, these are very populated areas that we operate in. And usually the way you land your, your, uh, your vehicle often determines the life of that vehicle. Uh, and so we go out of our way to make, uh, we went out of our way to make sure that our landing system not only fit in a very small footprint so we could operate next to a warehouse wherever we need to, uh, but it's also reliably gentle on the zip. This is another slow-mo, as you can see from another point of view. Zip catches its tail hook on that line, system pays out, hit that mat every time, and poofs onto a, well, a nice soft pad. Awesome. Um, this is another landing. I, I'm showing you this video partly to see another landing, but also to point out what's happening in the background here. You know, some people have talked about community acceptance as a potential impediment to, you know, using drones uh, in the real world. We were very worried about that when we were developing this system. Uh, for obvious reasons, in many parts of the world, drones have a very negative connotation. Uh, but we have not had this problem at all in Rwanda. We have spectators every day coming out to watch our operations. Uh, we love that they call the zips, they call them sky ambulances and the, the, the reception has been universally positive. Uh, we think that comes largely from just how visceral this problem is for everybody in these communities. They've all had, either directly or indirectly had a family member who, you know, whose healthcare treatment struggled or a doctor who struggled because uh, they had trouble, get, trouble getting access to some medical supply. And uh, um, anyway, it, it's been super positive and it's been a big part of the reason we've been able to scale up as fast as we have. So just a few sort of stats on how this works. Uh, the flight operations side of this takes two to three people to operate, depending on how many flights we're doing. Um, we're scaling up this distribution center to do 150 flights a day. Uh, our peak day so far has been 30 flights, and we're only serving a few of those 21 hospitals so far. Um, we estimate that the system like this has a return on investment uh, on the infrastructure side of about six months. Um, and uh, yeah, and as I'll get to in a little bit later, to achieve this mission and achieve this operational scale, we've, uh, we've built a lot of these systems from scratch. Obviously, you saw launch and recovery, um, but we also build those zips our, our own design, and so is our, the autopilot system uh, and all of our sort of safety systems. Uh, but I'll get into that a little bit later. Uh, a lot of people ask the question of why use a plane and not a multi-copter or a quadcopter or something like that. Um, Really, it comes down to what we call service radius is one of the biggest drivers. Looking at it from another point of view, it's efficiency. For the similarly sized vehicle, for similarly cost vehicle, you can fly much, much farther. Of course, area increases with the square of your, the, how far you can fly, and so you can dramatically inc increase the amount of, uh, well, land you can deliver to uh, with a system like this. Um, we can fly very fast. We think it's a, very good delivery experience. For those of you who haven't had the opportunity to have, to be around a large hovering drone, uh, the, the large hovering drones are sort of like four lawn mowers bolted together. And we don't think that being underneath one of those to receive a package is something people are gonna wanna do. Um, and we, can, we think we're providing a much uh, more practical delivery experience for, for the uh, delivering as you saw in that video. Um, then things like operating in wind in severe weather, and, and, which is sort of coupled with the safety challenge. We have many layers of fault tolerance or many layers of redundancy in this plane. Uh, should there be any problem with one piece of the plane, we can keep flying. Uh, and then we wrap that in more layers. That is much harder to achieve in something like a quadcopter or an octocopter. 
Um, and that safety case is obviously very, very important for operating in the real world at scale like this. So another gr challenge of operating the real world is weather. Uh, you know, we need to operate rain or shine in Rwanda, and when it rains in Rwanda, it pours. This is, uh, hopefully this isn't too loud, but it gives you a sense of. So, you know, very heavy rains. Uh, we designed for 50 millimeters an hour of rain, which is, you know, much stronger than a typical shower. Like, I mean, a shower in your house um, in terms of rain rates. And, uh, uh, and this is not just a challenge for the zips and making sure they can fly through this kind of weather, but it's also a challenge for operators. Uh, this next video I'm gonna show you is a video from uh, about a week after we set up in Rwanda uh, and the first big storm came through and we, well, had to stake some things down better than they were staked down previously. Oh, shit. Anyway, it's, uh, yeah. Um, and I think this is, it's very important, and it's important uh, in all applications of drones. Uh, the, the fellow who spoke about the UTM at the beginning of this se session, you know, talked about, you know, crazy altitudes. We're flying here at six to 9,000 feet, uh, and, but dealing with the rain, dealing with the winds you see, uh, it's a very big challenge uh, to do it in a very practical way because our operators cannot be worried about that. They need to be focused on getting the blood to who needs it as fast as possible. Um, and not trying to figure out like, oh, it's raining, I can't fly. You know, they just, it's gotta be, you know, it's gotta be easy. Um, and I think this video also points out, just a side note, working at Zipline is a bit different than a lot of startups. Um, and uh, this, is, this is a member of our flight operations team from the US who's since trained the Rwandan team. Um, this is a video of, make, this is a video out to a delivery site, sped up about 20 times. Um, this is a 20-minute flight you're watching. Uh, it gives you a nice flavor for the kind of terrain we're flying over, um, for basically the kind of problems we're solving, also the populations we're flying over. A lot of people make an assumption that we're, well, we're not flying over populated areas. And it's true, this is definitely not urban, but there are a lot of people who live here, and we take it very seriously to do that responsibly. Um, and uh, so you just saw the plane spiral down to lose altitude to drop a package, spiral back up, and now head home. Uh, and you'll see that it encounters rain on the way back. Um, one of the sort of, well, one of the more common experiences for new operators, flight operators in Rwanda, is they'll be sitting on a nice sunny day, and planes will just be coming home soaking wet. And, uh, and it, that, that's just the, an example of sort of how challenging the weather environment is. None of our weather data sources uh, that we're looking at uh, will tell us uh, that that rain is out there, but our planes do because they come home soaked. Uh, so you're going to see it do the same thing, fly back to the distribution center and land on the mat. Um, another great example of the challenges of operating in the real world, this is a, uh, what you're looking at here are the GPS tracks, basically the log data from five flights out to a delivery site that's out in the top corner, right corner of the image. If you look at these lines down on the bottom left of the image, you see they're nice and smooth and even. That's what we like to see. As, we, as the zips get into this mountain pass, you'll see they're not as smooth. <laughs> they get quite wiggly. Uh, and these, the, well, these planes are seeing winds uh, where the gust peaks are f higher than the plane actually flies. Um, and, uh, and this is a, sort of exemplifies the challenge of making your control systems and, and, everything, and your plane designs and things like that robust enough, or your drone designs robust enough to actually handle this is obviously key because you can't operate a, a delivery service at scale if you're losing planes with any regularity, obviously, uh, not to mention the safety implications of doing so. Another big part of what we do is basically enable uh, the operations of a fleet. Um, so this is a video where you're seeing three planes, well, three planes flying at once. And as an example of what you're actually looking at here, this is what you would see at, at the Rwanda Distribution Center if somebody goes and hits the big red button to disable the recovery system. All the planes coming in will queue and they'll wait until you pop that button back out and the planes then start landing again. Um, and it sort of exemplifies, uh, well, a big part of the challenge is how do you actually run a big, large fleet of planes in difficult weather uh, and be able to respond to requests from your regulator to say, hey, I want all your planes to come home right now. And obviously, those planes need to come home and not hit each other and land safely, and, and that needs to ha happen very easily. 
uh, for us, but, you know, in, the, in our case, one we call a zip controller who's piloting that fleet. Um, so, you know, we've obviously, we've designed a lot of the, the basically the multi-vehicle uh, algorithms from scratch, the deconfliction algorithms of how these planes basically achieve this uh, day in and day out. Um, I thought I'd show you one of our operator UIs. Uh, as you probably, as you may have noticed from that, uh, that video tour inside the distribution center. Uh, we have basically iPads kind of on the pre-flight stands and on the launchers. Those are all operator UIs for different phases of the vehicle turnaround process. This is the operator UI that the controller uses to fly a fleet of planes. Um, and uh, I'll show you a video of this actually in use in the real world here. Get this playing. So this is the, this is the video taken uh, of an op uh, during operations uh, end of last year. Um, you can see the operators zooming in to check on a plane, on a zip that's making a delivery. Um, at this moment, you can see there's two planes outbound in the top right there, both headed to the same d delivery site. Uh, about 20% uh, of our orders take more than one zip to fill. Um, and so that's, that's why you see more than one zip uh, going out to Nyanza there. Um, and it just gives you a sense of basically, well, the, the kind of tools we build to make it easy to oversee this fleet of planes. Uh, you can see him tap on a plane, it'll zoom right into that plane, and then it'll show him live uh, all the data uh, coming back from that plane. Um, yeah. So th this zip controller works in that air traffic control tower we have on top of the bathroom. Um, and uh, and that, that, um, the short version of our airspace integration plan with Rwanda is that Rwanda doesn't have a distinction between controlled and uncontrolled airspace the way the U.S. does. Rwanda is a relatively small country, uh, and in a lot of ways their regulatory schemes are much more progressive than the U.S., uh, but basically their entire airspace is controlled. Uh, and that basically the way we integrate in their airspace is we are uh, just like any other plane flying in Rwanda where the, control, the, the air traffic controllers in Kigali Air Traffic Control, that's the international airport in Rwanda, are literally tracking our flights and all the other flights in Rwanda uh, all at the same time. Uh, and here's a little, this is a video of, well, you see basically a, this is a plane about to get launched. Uh, and then this is, you're going to hear our controller communicating live with uh, Kigali Air Traffic Control after that zip takes off, hopefully. If you can turn up the audio, that'd be great. You'll also see in front of what he, the, the, zip, the zip controller not only has the controller UIs, but also has weather data sources, as well as a view of all the orders that are getting queued up in, under the tent, uh, and kind of as a bit of a ringleader uh, of the operation. So, a lot of people ask us why we design our own vehicles. Uh, we, don't, we hope to not have to design our own vehicles in the future, but uh, there's a few reasons we do now. One of the biggest reasons is range and payload. A uh, typical UAV that looks like this, or a drone that looks like this, is designed, uh, well, to take pictures, uh, and designed to stay in the air as long as possible, which is a very different aerodynamic optimization than if you're designing a plane to fly as far as possible with a heavy, large payload. Um, another big reason we design our own pl our planes from the ground up is for that safety. In order to get the fault tolerance or the redundancy in all features of the plane, everything from control surfaces, we literally can have control surfaces failure, propulsion failure, we can have any cable or connector failure, fail in the plane, uh, we can have any sensor go bad, we can, even the power system, we can lose a chunk of the power system and still keep flying. Uh, and obviously, designing that from the ground up is key uh, to be able to operate a system like this. Uh, and then couple that with how we f basically uh, fly this fleet of planes in a similarly robust, fault-tolerant way, where literally that controller and that UI could call somebody in California, and this has happened a couple times uh, since October, and someone in California can literally pop up the same UI and fly that fleet of planes, uh, basically with no sort of technical hur hurdle. Design that, we design that into the very core of the avionics, the, the electronics that, the, and software that flies the plane, uh, as, as well as the, as the plane sort of physical design uh, as well. Um, 
And then uh, this is a video you're about to see uh, of what we call our parachute landing system. This is our final layer of safety that wraps all the fault tolerance of the plane with a, well, with a big parachute. Um, This is, this is a demonstration test we did uh, end of last year. Uh, now that, that zip is floating to the ground slow enough that you could catch it. We do not recommend that you try to catch it, but it's coming down that slowly. Um, so b building redundancy into, into every level, level of the system is, is key for us, and it's key for the regulatory approvals. It's, uh, it's key for the operational reliability. Our customer counts on us to deliver blood. Uh, we're, we're literally, as we bring on these delivery sites, we are the sole uh, delivery provider for them of blood. Uh, so it, you know, we can't have downtime. Uh, this is not just a problem in East Africa. This is a photo from the Navajo Reservation in Arizona, United States, of a school bus getting to school. There's a lot of places in the states, a lot of places in the world that lack the physical road and bridge infrastructure that make running a 100% reliable medical supply logistics network basically impossible to achieve. Um, our long-term plan is to serve every remote hospital and health center in the world. We want to bring 100% access to these often rare, uh, sometimes expensive, and emergency uh, medical products. Um, we, we, the, the power of this is huge. There's obviously a lot of just basic access problems right now, but as you, and this comes back to the, I like the topic of democratizing the industry, we like to think of democratizing access to medical products. As these remote clinics have more access to more medical products to serve long tail, the quality of healthcare in these remote regions goes up because doctors can provide, uh, well, they can do more uh, with, with, with materials that are often only available you know, in cities and so on. Um, yeah, and we're just very excited about the way that changing me this medical logistics dynamic will allow patients to receive that high quality care much closer to home all around the world. Um, as I approach the end, I want to call out a few teams and a few sort of dynamics here. My, my role at Zipline is the head of product and engineering. Um, and, you know, I, we have another side of the organization which runs operations. Uh, this is our operations team that runs the distribution center in Rwanda. Uh, this team is incredibly elite. Uh, this, this team was, uh, we started building the team in October. Um, they, uh, they, they run this, operate, this distribution center uh, to an aerospace standard that we thought it would take us years to achieve. Uh, adopting best practices from the aerospace industry, automotive quality manufacturing, medical device manufacturing, basically bringing all these best practices into the day-to-day -day operations to really do something amazing. One really exciting milestone that we reached internally, for those of you uh, who have startups in the with big operational ch components, uh, we reached a milestone uh, about two weekends ago, going from one shift, five days a week, 10 hours a day operations, to two shifts, seven days a week, 12 hours a day operation. Uh, and that would not have been possible without this incredibly elite team. This is Zipline headquarters, and I point this out because, uh, well, our entire product development team uh, and prototyping facility and test flight facility are at the same location. So we bring the engineers and the problems really close together. And we found that to be instrumental for moving as fast as we have and to achieving a, a system that is as, as reliable as we've achieved. Um, we believe in instant delivery. All logistics is moving towards automation and speed, and the market for instant delivery is huge. Delivering the way things are delivered to late today with 3,000 pound vehicles driven by humans just doesn't make sense. It's not efficient, uh, it doesn't scale, uh, and there's so much opportunity to benefit from on-demand delivery uh, in, the, in the medical product world and elsewhere. We're building instant delivery network for the planet that can deliver products as quickly and as efficiently as the internet delivers information. And at Zipline, we're very excited about scaling this service to ensure all doctors and their patients in the hardest to reach parts of the world have access to the medical products they need whenever they need them. To close, I'd like to share a video of a Zip coming into land after making an emergency delivery of blood to support a woman who was suffering from postpartum hemorrhaging after giving birth. This was about a month ago.
Thank you. I may have burned all my time for questions, but I'm not sure. Uh, I hope Mike. Hi, this is Vaibhav Parikh from Nishit Desai. We are a law firm. Uh, very interesting uh, application. I was asking, we talked about one slide where it's payback time of six months. And I wanted to, if you can expand on that, because how do you get paid and how does it, how the economics work? Sure. Sorry. How much does it cost? Sure. So, so the details of the contract, uh, I'm not allowed to get into for confidentiality reasons, but basically uh, this is sold like a old school cell phone contract. So we basically uh, have a minimum monthly uh, number of deliveries that we basically sell to a customer uh, that basically covers the nut of uh, the infrastructure. There's obviously a fair amount of equipment uh, to set up at one of these distribution centers uh, and, the, sort of in the, and the core team that operates it. Uh, and then, of course, we can scale beyond that uh, with sort of incremental fees uh, if, if they need us to. I had a quick question on the communications. Are you, are you using satellite communications for this or radio? What exactly? We're not using, the question was, are we using satellite communications for this? We're not right now. Uh, right now we use uh, cellular and we use uh, a type of line of sight radio uh, in parallel. Um, and, uh, but that is something that's on our roadmap. Yeah. Uh, sorry, I will just add one quick note. Uh, you know, as, 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 as you may know from your accent, you know, a lot of people in the United States assume cell coverage is pretty bad. A lot of places in the world, cell coverage is much better than it is here, including in Rwanda. And we literally have had no cellular holes in any of our deliveries in Rwanda since October. So as a data point. Go ahead. And you wonder which, which place is the first world, right, uh, with the cell phone coverage. Um, just a point around, uh, you know, if it takes, uh, is it a franchise model or you own and operate all those centers and if you scale from country to country or other places, um, you know, um, could you expand on that? Sure. It's a good question. Right now we're very focused on a services model. Um, the governments that we work with, they want sort of a magical courier to, to sort of literally leapfrog this problem that, uh, that can have this dramatic health outcome in, in, impact. And uh, they don't want to. They don't want to get into you know how to operate you know these kinds of systems. The operations of these systems is challenging. Uh, you know we we've, we we have a lot of people with uh, aerospace operations experience on the team, and that's the sort of the kind of the axiom or the, the sort of the adage holds true. Fifty percent of the challenge is in how you engineer and design the system. Fifty percent of the challenge is how you operate the system. And either one can cause big problems in terms of, well, safety for, for, for our biggest concern. Uh, and uh, so at least at this point, all of our customer conversations right now are focused on, well, uh, on providing a service. Uh, and you know, we're looking later this year to expand to the other side of Rwanda. Uh, and, uh, and then we're working uh, on, on basically our second country uh, to start operating uh, hopefully next year. Hi, excellent presentation. Um, I had a question regarding um, why Rwanda and how was it approaching the government and how accommodating were they, I mean, um, considering, you know, you were someone from another country who was going to take part in their health care in some way. So if you could just talk a little bit about that. Sure. You know, we're obviously a startup, so we have to think of smart about how to manage risk. Uh, you know, we started customer development before we started any technical development. Because uh, we really believe that you, you know, designing technology without a customer who wanted it yesterday is sort of a fool's errand. You're not going to make the right thing. And uh, um, so we started this you know, three years ago. We worked with a bunch of companies early on. We narrowed it down to three countries uh, about a year and a half ago. Uh, or I guess more like two years ago now, we narrowed it down to three countries. And, uh, and then we worked with those three countries to figure out who was going to be first. As you can imagine, getting the civilization authority sign off getting the, obviously, the health uh, system integration. Uh, you know, we, we're a certified blood handling service in Rwanda. Uh, there's, uh, there's a lot of pieces to the puzzle. In most countries, the military, including Rwanda, the military has to sign off uh, to make sure they're comfortable with this. There's a lot of pieces, there's a lot of hurdles to get over. I should mention, obviously, getting the contract in place with, with the government is, is, you know, takes time. 
Uh, so that's how we treated it. And really, the reason Rwanda is first is because, really, of Rwanda. They are an impressive, they're, 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 that Rwanda is very impressive on many key fronts that made this happen first in Rwanda. Not the least of which, from my perspective, is fascinating is how data-driven their decision-making processes are. They have the data to make this decision very conclusively uh, in hand uh, from the beginning of this process. Uh, and that was, it's been very impressive. And that data was a big part of their decision-making process across all the stakeholders in the government that needed to buy into this. And that's very powerful. Um, you know, as you can probably imagine, in some other countries we were involved in, we saw politics dominate the decision-making conversation. <laughs> and, you know, obviously, Rwanda took a bet on us, too. You know, we had never done this before. They were working with us before we were flying anything at our test site in California. And uh, that's obviously, you know, that, that takes a lot for a government to be that uh, good at making decisions as well as uh, understanding and accepting risks. Great story, great product. Uh, I have an operational question. What happens if the, you know, if there's a problem with the drone and, you know, how do you retrieve it if there's an issue? Or is that baked into your model that is, you know, you could lose a few drones in a year or two? Yeah, so we, we definitely think about that. Um, we've had a few parachute landings in Rwanda. Uh, those zips are back in operation now. Um, the, some of that, I think, comes back again to the community acceptance piece. People in Rwanda know what we're doing, um, and the, the, the few times that's happened, they've taken care of the zips, stored them, called us, and we've gotten to, to pick them up. Um, and uh, yeah, so we, we, we work hard on that, and you know, one of the big challenges here is how hard it is to get to the level of operational reliability you need. Um, I think a lot of companies, especially companies that are spending a lot of time with kind of hobby grade drone equipment today do not respect the kind of, there's probably one to four orders of magnitude of work between that level of technology maturity uh, and even what you're seeing here, let alone where we want to be in three years. And uh, it's, it's getting those, getting systems to be reliable into those sort of five, six, nines of reliability. It's something that you're seeing a lot of these autonomous car companies struggling with today. It takes a, a, a certain culture, a, a lot of investment in, in simulation and testing. Um, it's not just about smart people in a room working hard. It's, it's, a, it's a very difficult technical thing to pull off. Thank you very much for this great and inspiring story. Um, I'd like to ask you, with this um, experience and data of this operational uh, life, how are you validating your design decisions and the key lessons learned you've done so far? Sure. Um, <laughs> there's a lot of lessons learned so far. I'm trying to decide where to, where to, which one to pick. I, um, one place that we, that we learned right off the bat when we started flying in the real world was we weren't carrying enough margin uh, in the plane's range design to really do this at scale. Um, so the version, of the, the version of the zip you see operating now, it's not gonna reach those furthest sites. Uh, the version of the zip that's currently in development will. Uh, but there's the amount of, to give you an example, uh, we, we follow the ground largely, very similar to the, w the way drones are regulated here. So it's not like we fly to altitude and fly across. To give you an example of the kind of margin we have to carry, uh, our most difficult to reach site in Rwanda, the plane will gain and lose a kilometer of altitude twice on the way out and of course twice on the way back. Uh, and that's separate from the margin you need for flying through you know, intense and sustained wind fields. Um, you know, it, at, uh, we basically design a zip now that can fly more than twice as far as that 75 kilometer number states. So if you think about it on a sort of flying flat and level, uh, to carry margin for wind, rain, uh, and all this altitude gain and loss. That, that's, that was, that, that's one really sort of challenging lesson that we've learned. Um, yeah, I think, I think in general, uh, well, I think that was probably the biggest one. <laughs>